This is uh, uh, this session today and yesterday, quite a historic occasion when um, uh, two legends of uh, tall ship sailing in the Americas meet together. Um, the first is Captain Dan Parrott, who was a master of the Pride of Baltimore too, and author of Tall Ships Down. Anybody read this? Absolutely recommended reading. The only problem is it's out of print now, so it costs twice as much as it used to cost when it was in print. And Dan doesn't get any of the uh, any of the author's royalties out of it, so I'm nagging him to nag McGraw Hill to uh, to reprint. Uh, and um, I'll I'll do a free commercial for him. He's just published this book, um, which is uh, I must say a really good read, and um, it tells you something about him that each chapter begins with a disaster. So <laughs> it's um, good good uh, bedside reading for um, uh, for masters. Um, Tall Ships Down is uh, really the most important analysis of sailing ship accidents published, uh, not only to date, but ever. Um, Dan's now a professor at Maine Maritime Academy, and he teaches and writes um, and uh, sails on academy vessels. Uh, <coughs> when we were um, in correspondence with each other by email, um, he said, I don't consider myself an expert on stability. I wouldn't be able to field all the conceivable questions on the subject uh, or illuminate the finer points. What I can do is to paint an overarching picture of where we've been through the period covered by tall ships down and draw some distinctions between those events with regard to stability and what Concordia could mean to us. So the second legend is uh, Captain Bill Curry. Um, who has spent five decades at sea on a, a wide range of vessels. And he was the master of the Concordia when she founded in 2010. Uh, I know that many of you will have read the um, Transportation Safety Board of Canada report, and you'll have formed your own opinions about it. But to my mind, one of the things that confers great distinction on Bill is his response to that report. Anybody who's been the subject of an accident investigation uh, will know how very wounding um, the experience is and how it's pretty well impossible not to feel that somehow you were in the wrong even if you did everything right. And so it would have been entirely understandable um, if he had simply uh, produced a rebuttal of this and tried to justify his, his position. But instead, if you read Bill's response, you'll see that he offers um, a cool and dispassionate analysis uh, of the accident, drawing on the same information and other information, but adding to it from his profound knowledge of sailing vessels, the Concordia, of course, in particular, and his experience of extreme weather. Uh, what he said in our early correspondence um, is that the stability lesson is that even with modern vessels custom designed to current standards and meeting international regulations for sail training vessels, knockdown and subsequent loss can occur. Uh, which is a sobering thought um, to leave with us. Uh, and as you'll hear, he has some thoughts about the measures that can be taken to mitigate that. Um, I think we are honored um, to meet both of these people in person uh, and to know that they want to share their learning with us for the benefit of the whole sail training community. Uh, there are other sessions that um, are connected with this. Some of you may have been to uh, Colum Newport and Jan Miles' session yesterday, um, and uh, you might also have been to the session that Terry Davis and Mark Clark were running, and in fact they're running it in parallel with this. You can't leave the room now, um, uh, on uh, handling accidents from shoreside. Um, but there are two more uh, sessions today um, which connect with this rather. One is the dynamics of uh, severe weather, which um, uh, Joe Sinkovitz from NOAA uh, is uh, uh, delivering later on. Uh, and um, you'll hear something of the dynamics of severe weather from Bill today. And this afternoon, incident analysis. Um, you can see into the mind of the accident investigator uh, this afternoon um, in learning how to investigate your own incident from Admiral Stephen Meyer. So um, let me then uh, hand over to Dan Parrott to, let me hand over to Bill Curry. <laughs> just getting, I'm just getting a, a heavenly message here. <laughs> let me hand over to Bill Curry. <laughs> okay, thanks Peter. 
Um, let me just get this, um, since I don't have my reading glasses on, I've got to get the, uh, just to get a feel for, no, I've got it, yeah, it's big enough now, the magic of, uh, how many um, skippers or mates in the audience, how many in the sailing crew, so the majority, uh, any naval architects, meteorologists, okay, well then you're exactly the audience I'm talking to, <clears throat> because I'm not a meteorologist, uh, I'm not a naval architect, uh, I'm not a physicist, but nevertheless, the subjects that um, I've been invited to talk about today um, uh, revolve around uh, weather and uh, its effect on um, ships, and particularly I'm going to use the example of the Concordia. And probably like you, uh, if I were sitting in the audience or an outside observer of this event, um, I would probably be... Th thinking the same things. How can today, with a purpose design, modern vessel, um, fully inspected, um, conservatively run, end up in this situation? Uh, it's a puzzler. Um, we have the Transportation Safety Board's um, um, report, which is um, this thing, here we go. Uh, which is one, but there are actually three documents uh, concerning this accident that I think would be useful to you, and um, you should probably read them in series. The first is uh, our report, and this report was written um, based on interviews I did with the students, the faculty, and the crew um, immediately after the loss. Uh, it's pretty much a narrative. The second, of course, is the official investigative report by the Canada Transportation Safety Board, uh, which was released in July of 2011. And it is the most easily accessed report, of course, because it's on their website. Uh, the third would be um, my public response to the TSB report, uh, in which I go through um, a discussion about the event uh, in much greater detail than I'll be able to do today. There's about 175 pages of... Uh, specifics in those documents and you're probably one of the only audiences in the world who would find that uh, both um, fascinating and relevant uh, to your own work uh, so I do appreciate you being here today uh, to uh, to listen to me uh, today I'm going to cover four topics the first of course the nature of the squall um, in my opinion, the most likely cause of the knockdown was a microburst squall, and I might uh, at this point in time say microburst slash downburst, um, so that we're not um, getting into any semantics more about that. Um, and uh, this is important because only by doing so will we be encouraged to focus more of our attention on the unique aspects of this type of storm. Dynamics of the knockdown. Um, I don't believe that the uh, TSB report accurately explains the full mechanics of the knockdown, and so today I'll go into some detail uh, with you on that point um, using um, data directly from the Transportation Safety Board. And finally, uh, this is a subject that uh, has not received a great deal of attention. Um, in fact, I haven't been able to find uh, literature or published reports or studies about the effects of inclined uh, winds anywhere. Um, so I'm inviting your attention to this question. More questions today than answers. And then finally, I want to talk about briefly the role of deck houses, which were critical to um, the um, outcome in the case of the Concordia and uh, how they play out with overall stability and uh, your own operational procedures. So, um, beginning with squalls, we'll take this statement from the um, Transportation Safety Board. Um, again, today I want to focus specifically on the science of this event. You'll have to excuse me if I say if uh, the emotion of being in this particular position um, uh, comes through too strongly. But there are some things I do have to specifically say about the Transportation Safety Board's uh, response. One of them is that this statement is actually incorrect and misleading. In fact, it's not a conclusion that careful readers of the Canada Transportation Safety Board would probably come to on their own. 
and as a resort, uh, result, it has led to a considerable amount of confusion, especially in the press, and um, to some degree among um, professional sailors. Um, leading to the question of whether this event uh, was any different to those than the ship had survived over her nearly 400,000 miles at sea in nearly 20 uh, year career. In actual fact, I think you find that there are significant differences here. Um, so we'll try to focus on those. So first of all, about the squall. In the past, you know, our investigations had to rely on um, testimony from survivors matched with what we knew about the large scale meteorological event. But now using um, satellite imagery, meteorologists can zoom in geographically and focus on um, a very narrow time frame uh, and position to understand the weather conditions that could directly affect a specific incident. In the case of the SV Concordia, uh, we have this image, um, which is only one of uh, many made available by meteorologist Ken Pryor. Um, who has an interest and whose specialty is in developing uh, downburst, microburst forecast products. And I understand that this has come along um, considerably in just the last three or four years. In a blog written within a month of the accident, uh, Pryor concludes, uh, quote, SV Concordia sank off the coast of Brazil near Rio de Janeiro, most likely due to strong convective storm-generated winds the Concordia was capsized in a downburst that occurred around 1500 UTC, about 500 kilometers off the coast. Graphical microburst potential guidance derived from a three hour forecast of the global forecast system model, valid at that time, indicated a high risk of downbursts in the approximate location of the sinking of the Concordia. Uh, in a later paper, Using additional satellite data and images, um, Pryor reviewed the evidence uh, again and stated, quote, note that the dry air notch was pointing directly to the location of the Concordia, and thus the vessel was in the direct path of downburst winds. Also, it appears that the Concordia was in an optimal location to experience both the horizontal and the vertical components of the downburst winds. This suggests that the vessel experienced the early part the contact to outburst stages of a microburst. Um, but Ken Pryor was not the only one uh, to look into this in response to a request from the um, Canada uh, TSB. Meteorologists from Environment Canada also looked at the circumstances of the case and also determined that um, conditions immediately above the Concordia uh, were conducive to the formation of downbursts and microbursts. This analysis by the Environment Canada uh, is available to you in full. Uh, it is attached uh, to the document, which will be on um, Sail Training International's website uh, here in, a, I don't know when, Peter, a week or so, um, as part of my uh, response to the TSB. Uh, I'd like to quote two points from that um, response by the uh, Environment Canada. First, quote, Although the occurrence of a strong microburst can neither be confirmed nor denied from this meteorological analysis due to a lack of information, we didn't have instrumentation aboard the ship that recorded that, a weaker downburst occurrence is much more likely in this case because the intensity of the convection was weaker than in many other cases have shown when strong microbursts were evident. One of the unique aspects that I intend to show today is you don't need a strong wind event, especially a downburst or microburst, to adversely affect um, our ships. And uh, four, their, their fourth point, quote, downburst winds with speeds from the west to southwest in excess of 80 kilometers an hour, or approximately 43 knots, following the initial gust front passage likely did occur at the time of the knockdown and in the location where the SV Concordia capsized. Uh, so, as you'll see in a few minutes, uh, as I said, microbursts don't have to be extreme wind events. Um, so, I hope you'll um, be able to take in uh, Joe's talk about uh, these events, but um, first of all, we need to get over uh, the question of uh, terminology. And um, according to the TSB report, uh, 
Um, the wind speeds attained during the occurrence were lower than those typically required for classification of a microburst, which for terrestrial events is in the range of 50 to 150 knots. The maximum wind speed during the occurrence is unlikely to have been in excess of 50 knots. But uh, again, according to Pryor in his own independent uh, work, um, quote, the Canada TSB report uses the threshold for microburst occurrence as a measured wind speed of 50 knots. This is not consistent with published literature that sets the minimum peak wind speed for microburst occurrence at uh, 10 meters a second or approximately 20 knots. And uh, particularly telling, which I found absolutely fascinating, because my conception of microburst before was, uh, you know, violent um, windstorms. But in a mid-Atlantic coastal region study that Ken Pryor conducted during 2010 and 2011, quote, the majority of measured downburst wind speeds were between 35 and 49 knots, with an average speed of 46 knots. And, quote, the TSB's use of the 50-knot threshold excludes the majority of downburst microburst events that could be documented. So again, what we're focusing on here is the mechanics of, or the dynamics of a, of a downburst, uh, and not so much whether you call them microburst, downburst, or macroburst, et cetera. It's the physics of the event that we're interested in. Okay, well, moving to the next question. Uh, I've got to clip through these slides um, fairly quickly. Um, and again, I'm not a naval architect. Uh, hopefully, I've uh, set this up um, accurately, and I'm essentially using information directly taken from the TSB report. According to the Canada TSB, this curve in red, which I've reproduced uh, here, um, represents the riding arm of the SV Concordia at the time of the occurrence. Regarding this curve, the TSB notes that, quote, the effect of water entering the deck houses via the open doors was modeled by eliminating the buoyancy contribution of the relevant space at which that became immersed. Um, and, but otherwise this occurrence, riding arm curve, quote, closely resembles the approved arrival condition taken from the ship's stability booklet. And as you all know, um, uh, our conditions uh, on sailing and mid-voyage and arrival um, do vary considerably with our, generally our worst stability picture being um, on arrival. I'm going to come back to this slide because there's a lot more to say about these two curves. Uh, first of all, there is a problem with this riding on curve. Um, I did speak to the uh, investigators directly about this. Um, but it, it indicates a powerful negative riding arm at just over 90 degrees. Dive straight through 90 degrees here, suggesting that the vessel would immediately turn turtle after being knocked down. In fact, the Concordia lay on her side at an angle of between 95 to 100 degrees for nearly 18 minutes before finally capsizing to almost the full 180 degrees and then um, soon after sinking. Um, the researchers said that essentially their investigation really did not go any further than 90 degrees and they recognized that uh, this curve dropping down there does not ref uh, reflect reality. Nevertheless, with that exception, we'll, we'll um, use this curve as accurate um, up to or close to that point. So from the Mariner's point of view, we know that among other factors, the healing moment uh, is proportional of course, to the area of the surface, exposed to the wind, and to the velocity of the apparent wind squared. We know that for a horizontal wind, uh, it is maximum when we're upright and decreases to a minimum when we're on our beam end. So most wind healing arm curves, uh, of course, will have their max um, at the left, and by the time they get to 90 degrees, more or less, uh, are reduced to zero. The wind healing arms uh, used here um, depict the um, occurrence sail plan uh, at the time of the event. Essentially, 43% of the total sail area are what the ship's stability booklet referred to as uh, short sail. So now we'll add the wind healing arm curve uh, required to heal the vessel to approximately 23 degrees. Her measured heel angle during the two minutes immediately 
um, preceding the knockdown, necessitating a horizontal apparent wind speed of up to about 28 knots. The mate's recollection of the uh, wind speed at that time was, uh, quote, well under 20 knots, unquote, and he did not see any signs of increased wind, although rain was imminent. The mate did not perceive any danger in the weather developing around the ship or by the fact that the ship had heeled to this angle. When the vessel heeled and steadied at this approximate angle, although I hadn't been yet called, I was um, um, below after turning over the watch to the second mate, um, I got up um, from my cabin and prepared to go on deck. Because of course, uh, one of the traditional rules that we've used um, for a long time, uh, deck edge immersion has long been considered a, a red line, a guide. Uh, for many vessels, the riding arm curve will reach a maximum soon after deck edge immersion and to be sailing uh, anywhere close to this angle of heel, of course, uh, puts us in danger not only from squalls, uh, but also just from gusts, which are more easily uh, for, uh, forecast or uh, predicted. Although during the two minutes prior to the knockdown, the Concordia was sailing at an angle several degrees below her deck edge immersion, uh, which was a pretty generous angle, um, by healing from 10 to 23, from the 10 to the 23 degrees, she was indicating of course, a heightened risk. So I'm going to digress just a moment here to make sure um, uh, we cover um, a couple of topics. One, uh, the so-called squall curves, um, the curves of maximum steady heel angle to prevent down flooding and gusts and squalls uh, developed by Barry Deacon and researchers at the Wolfson unit in the UK as a guide to mariners uh, to help them assess the risk of healing beyond their down flood angles. How many, um, how many of you have um, squall curves in your stability booklets that you're aware of, you're working with? One, two, three. Um, yeah, um, I'm in particular wondering about this, um, this curve, which pretty much comes directly from Barry Deacon's work. It would look very similar to this. It's not very familiar to us in the United States, um, um, but I have come across it on UK vessels, um, and essentially that's where it's been developed. So just to um, talk just a little bit about that. Uh, um, we did have um, curves aboard the, um, uh, the Concordia and the stability booklet. Um, and uh, one of the elements of the curves is this, um, angle of um, a maximum steady heel angle for gusts. And gusts, of course, are more reliably predicted than squalls um, being figured out. Um, according to Deacon's work, <coughs> uh, I think 1.4 times the um, ambient wind speed, maybe twice the pressure. Um, so they establish a curve that gives you at least some guidance if you're sailing in a weather system um, that involves gusts rather than squalls. Uh, the squall curves also help you determine your vulnerability uh, to squalls, but predicting the wind in any given squall is, as you know, um, more difficult. And this graph indicates that during the hour preceding the knockdown, the Concordia was positioned well below her gust limit and also positioned to withstand squalls up to about 40 knots. Um, during the morning, um, prior to the event, uh, we had spent a number of hours uh, reducing sail uh, in order to provide just this level of protection for the vessel. When the Concordia encountered the first phase of the squall that would knock her down and healed her to 23 degrees, the curves show that she was still more or less in the same position regarding her vulnerability, so essentially vulnerable to everything to the right of the dot. So if you were expecting um, gusts of um, um, up to 30 knots, um, you're in good condition under the sail plan you've got set and your average heel at that point in time. If you're expecting gusts up to 45 knots, it's not going to work. So this um, essentially uh, helps position you. As you can see, one of the requirements of this curve is that the master or the mate is able to accurately predict the level of the squall that they may or may not um, experience. Uh, it's probably one of the devils in the details on that 
Um, well, before I got out of my cabin, um, and um, within about a minute and a half or two minutes of the vessel healing to that 23 degrees, uh, she was knocked down uh, to her beam ends. And this wind healing arm curve uh, represents the horizontal wind speed that would be needed to push the Concordia over to a critical angle of heel, uh, that is uh, just under 40 degrees, where her riding arm uh, reached a maximum. And her rail went under. I don't know if you've seen this photograph before. It's um, one that was taken by uh, one of our students, Erica Trimble, who not only managed to uh, snap this incredible shot as she clambered off to the weather side there, but she held onto her camera and uh, it all survived uh, two and a half days in the rafts. And um, uh, so we have it as a record of essentially the moments just as the rail is going under and within about three seconds, the ship will be on her side from this photograph. So back to uh, analysis of exactly what was going on at that point in time, the slopes and general shapes of the riding arm and the wind healing arm curves are similar at some point soon after the riding arm starts to decline, that is if, then very little addition, additional healing force is required to push the vessel down to a point where some positive change is encountered, perhaps at a much greater angle of heel. For the Concordia in her light ship condition, once healed to about 38 degrees, the vessel will continue to heel and theoretically take up a steady heel angle of 68 degrees. So the point here, of course, is that the critical heel angle um, comes very early. Although, I would invite you to think back to that first slide where you could see that the range of stability that the Concordia in, um, enjoyed was, although the graphs didn't go that far, probably well over 120, 130 degrees. Uh, so this is one of the uh, situations I hope to bring your attention to, what can happen to that very generous riding arm that, uh, that we think we enjoy. So moving into the actual analysis, I'm convinced that the Canada TSB's analysis of what happened next is actually an error. It misses just a, um, a two or three second um, very critical point uh, in the dynamics of the situation. It revolves around flooding and the role it played in the knockdown and the subsequent capsize. And uh, in the case of the Concordia, there were really two distinct uh, phases to the flooding. Um, we'll jump into those in a minute, but I want to talk just uh, real briefly about the terms so that we, we're using the same terms. I'll use knockdown to refer to the arc from the steady heel angle at which the ship was sailing immediately prior to the event, that is around 23 degrees, through to the angle of her repose, that is at 90 degrees. And I'll use the term capsize from the arc uh, from 90 degrees to nearly 170 degrees, at which angle um, she was finally uh, seen to sink. In the knockdown phase, the water first entered the forward deck house and later certain portions of the after deck house. And once on her beam ends, the second phase began, uh, at first relatively slowly, accelerating uh, really rapidly prior to her final roll. And the time frame now in which these events unfolded is, uh, is critically important. The knockdown took all of about 10 seconds. It proceeded more or less smoothly um, with no interruption uh, and no pause. And during this phase, of course, all hands were pretty much uh, looking after themselves um, as I invite you to just think of this room being turned on its side and suddenly we and all of our chairs are down there on um, what was the bulkhead and is now the sole. And um, our issue is to get out one of these doors for which there is no ladder. <laughs> uh, we don't often think about our ships in that way. Um, when we practice emergency drills and evacuations, whether it's done at night and whether we block off one exit and make everyone find the other exit, et cetera, we're always doing it with the ship in an upright situation. Um, one of the things we learned with Concordia is that uh, due to the way she was laid out in her accommodations and with her companion ways, it was relatively easy to get out of the accommodations and up to the main deck. 
So once on our uh, beam ends, uh, the ship floated, uh, gradually sinking deeper, but remaining at this attitude for about uh, 15 to 18 minutes. Now the time it took the ship to down flood surprised me. I, I honestly thought the vessel would sink before we completed the process of getting off the vessel. Um, maybe that was due to reading Dan's book, <laughs> in which, as you'll know, uh, many of the stability casualties sank uh, in under a minute or two, and the vessel was gone. I'll explain why it didn't happen in our case here in a minute, but as it was, every last second of that 18 minutes uh, was used to launch the life rafts, uh, free them from the ensuing entanglement on obstructions, and get people into the rafts. And uh, I related directly to your um, talk yesterday, Colm, about um, why do um, rafts have such long painters designed for really big ships, for small vessels? Um, why are these painters um, not designed to float? Uh, they certainly sink, and they immediately become wrapped on every last hook, belaying pin, obstruction on the vessel. Um, so I usually ask the audience uh, to raise the right hands and repeat after me. I promise to always have my knife, except maybe when I'm in the shower. <laughs> I had to borrow a, nice a knife twice. Um, a lot of crews carry knives uh, lashed directly to the uh, safety equipment so that if you don't happen to have a knife on your hip, uh, when the emergency hits, you don't have to go far to look for one. And certainly there are knives inside the life rafts, as we know, but um, we certainly used knives a lot before we got into the rafts. The final capsize uh, went pretty quickly, and um, again, every last second of this uh, time period was used essentially cutting away the tangled lines and getting the rafts clear of the rigging. One of the uh, unique things, well, probably not unique, but uh, interesting things was that um, the vessel capsized the port, the sails were sheeted out, um, guide, um, the yards were only braced up a point or two, and when the vessel immediately capsized, we were in the lee of the hull, and the sea was remarkably low, so we were able to um, get the um, rafts launched, get our life jackets um, out of the sea and from underneath the sails, etc. cetera. Um, before the um, full event was over, um, the vessel had turned around completely so that she had essentially pivoted on her submerged sails and the deck area in which we were working was now the weather side of the vessel and we were pounded un unmercifully at that point in time. Um, we managed to essentially have everybody aboard about the time that occurred, had it occurred earlier it would have been much more difficult because um, the hull did provide that protection. Well, back to uh, the knockdown analysis here. Um, this is the official conclusion of the uh, Canada TSB. So I invite you just just to um, uh, listen, um, and I'll, I'll get back to um, elements of the statement in a moment. But, quote, as figure eight indicates, Although the vessel would theoretically take up a steady heel angle of almost 70 degrees in such winds, water would have begun entering at various critical points before that angle was reached. First via the open doors in the forward deck house, 56 degrees, then shortly thereafter via the sanitary exhaust vent, which was just aft of that, 65 degrees. With all of the doors on the port or lee side, as well as the ventilators and engine room skylight in the open position at the time of the knockdown, there was nothing to prevent or mitigate the down flooding that followed, progressing until the vessel ultimately lost all stability, rolled over, and capsized. Um, it didn't exactly work that way. And um, the statement does not act, uh, adequately address the critical element of time in which these evolutions occurred. And uh, this brings us directly to the question of how to resolve the discrepancy between the theoretical steady heel angle of 68 degrees and the fact that the ship did not come to rest or even pause at this angle. She fell in, as I said, one complete and smooth motion, passing through that arc from 23 degrees to 90 plus in less than 10 seconds, 
and through that critical sub-arc from 68 degrees to 90 plus degrees in only two or three seconds, and again with no hesitation. In order to get past the steady heel angle of 68 degrees, the TSB sights flooding through the open doors of the forward deck house. But we've seen that that curve has already been adjusted. The riding curve has already been adjusted for that loss of buoyancy. So we can't apply it a second time in this case. It's already been subtracted, if you will, from the curve. The sanitary exhaust vent, which was about 30 centimeters square, located about a meter and a half uh, up the side of the forward deck house, was connected by ducting to spaces below the bulkhead deck, and it would have been a down floating point um, as the hull went through that critical angle above 68 degrees to 90 degrees. However, um, the report continues on to enumerate a number of down flooding points relating to the theoretical steady heel angle uh, of 68 degrees that were, according to its own analysis, not capable of flooding at that angle. Um, so here's the list of the principal openings. Uh, as I mentioned, the sanitary vent would have flooded as it went under. Um, when queried, the um, Transportation Safety Board, however, said that they had not actually calculated the rates of down flooding through that opening uh, or how it would have affected um, the stability. But of course, we know down flooding to the hull would adversely affect the stability. The top of the mizzen, which was uh, listed as one of those events to get you through from the 68 to the 90, in fact, uh, would not have immediately flooded um, because it wasn't even under at that angle. And when it did go under at over 90 degrees, uh, the mizzen truck was underwater, but um, it sloped up from the water to the ship. Um, we could get under the main boom, which we had to do, uh, get under the main sole to retrieve some of the life jackets. Uh, after about four or five minutes of settling, we could still get under the gooseneck. So at that point in time, the center line of the ship was still probably about a foot or a foot and a half um, above uh, the mean water level. So no flooding um, through that route yet. The engine room skylight, according to um, the TSB, uh, would not have flooded until 100 degrees, so it wasn't even in the water during that critical period and could not have contributed any down flooding. And although the most significant down flooding points to the hull were the companionways leading down from the deck houses to the accommodation deck below, uh, they also did not submerge until much later. Um, I promise to get back to an explanation of why we didn't sink immediately or quicker. Um, of course, a number of factors, but probably the most important was that the interior companionways were offset slightly to starboard of the center line of the ship, essentially uh, just on the center line and, and to, to starboard. And the ship was knocked down to port. So they remained above water throughout the evacuation, providing a safe and dry route from the accommodation deck to the deck houses um, and thence on to the deck. This is about what the scenario looks like. I've sailed aboard quite a few vessels where this situation, in fact, uh, doesn't exist and there are offset companionways leading below from the deck houses. Um, and as you could see, an unprotected companionway um, that was flooding would be a major problem for people trying to get out. But, uh, see, returning to the TSB's conclusion that down flooding to the hull erased the residual rise of the Concordia's riding arm curve beyond 68 degrees, uh, I can't find any evidence uh, in the report that this was actually so. So looking elsewhere, uh, could the wind have been stronger than observed or estimated? The TSB report says that the horizontal wind speeds experienced by the vessel at the time of the knockdown we're in the range of about 25 to 50 knots. The TSB also provides this graph of wind speed versus heel angle in which we can see that due to the continuing decline of the wind healing arm, the steep rise of the riding arm curve um, beyond 68 degrees, significantly more wind than was observed would have been needed to knock the vessel down beyond that angle. 
the TSB calculated that it would require about 120 knots or more to lay the vessel down onto her beam ends, and there was no indication that uh, such winds occurred. So regarding this issue of getting over that rise in the riding arm curve beyond 68 degrees, we've seen that, um, first of all, uh, there, there couldn't have been a significant loss of stability due to down flooding through that one ventilation duct uh, within the two or three second period it took to pass through that small um, arc. And 100 plus knots of wind simply did not occur. Um, this was not an extreme wind event. Uh, when it hit the papers, and in, in um, Canada anyway, um, all of the reporters of course wanted to report that this was uh, due to um, huge seas and um, major storm off the coast of Brazil, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, not the fact. Um, it was a fairly minor wind event, so how could it have happened? Well, um, I'm suggesting um, the possibility of uh, inclined winds, and this is why. Uh, we need to look at what would happen if the winds were descending, as they do in any squall at some point, in some degree, um, were descending at an angle of um, 30 degrees or even greater at 45 degrees. Um, these angles are features of downbursts, um, and it seems uh, probable that highly inclined winds affecting a vessel on the surface can occur in the early contact stages of microbursts or downbursts. This is the subject that I, I hope is taken seriously enough to warrant more study, and it's part of why I've spent so much time uh, going through the evidence that shows that uh, downburst microbursts most likely did occur uh, over the Concordia. Uh, meteorologists have been measuring the speed, the duration, and the inclination of winds from microbursts for decades, uh, and this is ongoing. Um, I'm hoping that perhaps uh, in the future there'll be some wind tunnels, um, which will look at the effect of inclined winds uh, on sailing vessel models. But here's what the graphs can tell us. So this is the theoretical part of the picture. This is the wind healing arm for a breeze of up to about 31 knots, enough in uh, the ship's occurrence condition to heal the Concordia to just about that deck edge immersion I mentioned. Um, this is a hypothetical. She was sailing below that uh, level and then she was knocked down. But we're using this as what level of wind could have um, carried out these physics. here. I'm sorry. Uh, before I move to that slide, I just need to say that what we're going to do here is we're going to um, uh, assume any angle of inclination we choose in this case and look at its effects by shifting the wind healing arm curve to the right along the x-axis, the equivalent number of degrees because it's apparent that the maximum value for the wind healing arm will con coincide with a vessel that's healed to 30 degrees. So hor horizontal vessel upright, maximum value, if you're healed to 30 degrees, the maximum value for that wind healing arm will also start at 30 degrees. So we can simply shift the curve to the right, and we see immediately that such a combination of sail area, the wind speed, the inclination from the horizontal is all it takes to overcome the residual rise of the ship's riding arm. The result in this case of winds inclined only that uh, 30 degrees uh, would be an un uninterrupted knockdown to 90 degrees. We don't need to talk about down flooding or anything. We've already erased the pushback from the deck houses. Um, down she goes. So clearly this sort of graphical solution needs to be tested in a wind tunnel by, um, by the professionals. But it does seem to indicate, and this is one of the take home points I hope to, to leave with you, that winds inclined from the horizontal have a dramatic and negative effect on the ability of a sailing vessel to withstand a knockdown. It makes intuitive sense. The relief valve, if you will, of spilling the wind as you heel to greater angles is negated by wind that does not follow our conventional thinking. Uh, or the horizontal thinking. This result implies that vessels with ranges of stability well beyond 90 degrees are vulnerable, and I'll come to back, uh, back to that in just a minute here. 
what would the picture have been if the deck houses had not been flooded? Again, here is the riding arm curve indicating uh, the two conditions. Um, and clearly, it's vastly superior to the compromised state. So how much superior? Well, in this case, we're going to look at a wind speed of about 40 knots, which is below the average wind speed for the 46 knots uh, as an average measured by meteorologist uh, prior, and below that maximum of 50 knots estimated uh, and reported by the TSB. Then we assume these winds are inclined to 45 degrees, and the results of this exercise were absolutely shocking to me. Um, even with the lure doors closed, the Concordia could have suffered a full knockdown. So that's a pretty sobering result. We're shifting uh, the wind 45 degrees. One of the real big questions we need to know uh, from the scientists is what is the angle of the wind within the strike range of our vessels? Um, the literature is full of stories of um, the top hamper being carried away by um, sudden gusts from aloft uh, out of conditions that are norm not normally associated with squalls. Um, we're now at a point where we can get beyond these anecdotal stories and take it right into uh, the labs and do some study. But there is a solution here. Um, a vessel need not lay passively on her side, unable to eventually right herself if her full range of stability is preserved. And ladies and gentlemen, this brings me to a conclusion that I completely and totally share with the authors of the TSB report and that the Concordia might not have been lost had her deck houses been closed. And I'm not going to get into a big discussion about deck houses being open or, or closed um, here because we don't have time, but a couple words on that in a little bit. But I promised to look at other vessel types. Um, so here I've plotted the riding arm curve for a typical 120-foot trunk cabin schooner, um, along with the intact riding arm curves for the Concordia, both vessels in their arrival condition. Um, note that the schooner has a range of stability to just over 90 degrees. I'll use the 40 knot uh, wind healing arm curve here generated for the Concordia's current sail plan as an, as an example. If this 40 knot breeze was from a microburst or downburst and was inclined to 35 degrees, the trunk cabin schooner would be knocked down completely, while the vessel with deck houses, which you see using the Concordia as an example here, uh, would heal to about 76 degrees, a pretty considerable heel, but not all the way down on our beam ends. Another example, this is the riding arm curve for a typical um, modern brigantine uh, designed with a substantial deck house and with a raised poop deck. Um, these riding arm curves are taken directly from information from stability booklets um, plotted on the same scale as the Concordia's for uh, easy comparison here. So this curve again represents that vessel's arrival condition um, and our example horizontal wind, arm, wind healing arm curve. Uh, she would heal to about 33 degrees but should she encounter a downburst or inclined winds of only 15 degrees elevation, she would then continue to heal rapidly, should hit that critical point, continue to heal rapidly to about 70 degrees before her deck houses, hopefully closed, would uh, finally stop her knockdown. Again, this example tends to illustrate the value of deck houses and their contribution to extending the range of stability. It also illustrates the limited usefulness of designing to a 60 degree down flooding threshold. Um, there are other elements in the design of the vessel. Uh, I understand that will also produce a, a secondary rise to the curve. Am I? Thank you, sir. Um, well, clearly, uh, the stakes are high for most sailing vessels, encountering inclined winds from microbursts or any other downburst event. 
Uh, I don't believe that Concordia is an example of lax or casual watertight door procedures. Um, they were closed quickly enough when danger was perceived, and it was not a practice to sail with the lured doors closed at all times. And that's where, um, again, I invite comparison to uh, your own policies and your own experience. That has not been the practice of board uh, that is sailing with your deck house doors closed at all times you're underway and under sail. It has not been the practice or policy of board any of the more than dozen uh, sailing passenger vessels or sail training vessels um, that I've sailed aboard over the past 40 years, um, all corners of the globe. One of the common complaints uh, leveled against um, the doors, of course, is that uh, they can contribute to um, danger in a seaway, the risk of uh, broken bones and crushing injuries from continual opening and closing. Um, so what we're faced with here as uh, operators is um, um, balancing the question of how to balance the risk between possible low stake outcomes, uh, somebody's finger being crushed because the door is being used, um, you know, several times a minute, um, versus highly improbable, but um, hugely catastrophic event that is suffering a knockdown should the doors be open. Uh, we have a particular problem aboard sail training vessels in that uh, typically we function with the constant flow of people to and from um, the weather deck. It's part of how um, you know we're not battened down with cargo for a long trip. We've got our cargo coming in and out of the deck houses constantly. So this is really a design problem. Centerline hatches, scuttles, ventilators, and companionways um, have long been one solution, but these are not mandated by regulation in many nations. The 60 degree down flood limit seems to be a regulatory benchmark, but since such off center openings are allowed, um, if they're fitted with watertight closures, uh, this may be a somewhat misleading and potentially dangerous um, policy. It seems to me that human error will always be a factor in maritime accidents, and that if we are smart, we'll recognize this and constantly strive to increase the safety design factors that make our ships better able to withstand these emergencies. Here's an idea for a deck house uh, designed to protect its buoyancy contribution regardless of the status of the doors. The house, as you can see, has uh, two watertight doors to the weather deck, two emergency exits, uh, perhaps windows. The foyers serve as hallways or storage areas for foul weather gear, harnesses, grab and go emergency equipment. And I've uh, got a centerline companionway here leading below to the accommodation deck. Now we tip the vessel over on our side and the buoyancy of the deck house is preserved because of the sill effect of that simple, relatively cheap addition to the deck house. Um, we've still got our exits and the absolutely critical companionway down below is fully protected. Okay, well, I'd like to wrap up with some recommendations. Uh, I recognize that uh, for an international assembly such as this, um, there'll be wide variety of experiences, a lot of different ships, um, different procedures, so not all of these um, would fit. But if your vessel has not been provided with a set of curves or squall curves, um, they're good tools. Uh, many American um, vessels don't have those. Um, but the squall curves, of course, are only as good as your guess at the squall intensity, and they do not take into account inclined winds. Uh, they're a tool, but not the answer. Consider having a naval architect draw up a set of wind healing arm curves for a variety of sail plans typical to your vessel and compare these with your vessel's riding arm curves for departure, mid-voyage, and arrival conditions. The juxtaposition of these curves will help you understand your vessel's stability characteristics. Compare the slopes of the wind healing arms and the riding arms after the point of maximum lever Determine if there is a healing to a critical angle, which will result in a much deeper heel following with very little additional wind. If that's the case for your vessel, you really want to know. Uh, determine if the intact buoyancy of your deck house or other structures um, has been included in your vessel's riding arm curve. If that's the case, and it probably is the case, 
uh, then um, I'd invite you to rever re review how you protect uh, those spaces, what your policies are. And finally, um, give a really good look at all of the major down flooding points and angles, um, but especially have a very critical look at what would happen to your companionways leading below in the event of a full or partial knockdown. Uh, just as a post note to this, um, sometime after the accident, um, I worked aboard another sail training vessel in the Pacific who has uh, offset uh, companionways leading below from deck houses, one on port, one on starboard. Uh, that organization immediately adopted the policy of lure doors closed and signed at all times we were underway, uh, under sail. Um, and the crew simply had to learn to use the other door instead of the, what they've been doing for the last 15 years with the vessel, which is using either door based on discretion of the crew. I didn't have to impose that solution on them. It was aboard the ship when I found it, and they said, um, Bill, the reason we're doing it this way is because we heard your story, and we can't say we can always keep the doors closed if something happens, so we're just going to close it ahead of time. That's a good solution. In their case, had they been knocked down with the lure door open, um, it would have been very difficult to evacuate from their accommodations because it would have been a uh, major flood. Okay, well, thank you. I'm sorry if I have totally lost track of time here. I appreciate your attention. Colleagues, uh, it's great to be here and thank you for your time. Uh, what I'm going to do this morning is, is actually build upon what I talked about yesterday, uh, and I will try to uh, bring you up to, up to speed on, on what we did talk about, but it's a somewhat different presentation. So yesterday I reviewed uh, three other knockdown cases that had significance for the sail training community, and those vessels were the Albatross, 1961, the Marquez, 1984, and the Pride of Baltimore, 1986. Each of these vessels uh, entailed, each case entailed uh, multiple fatalities and a, and a total loss of the vessel. And each of these incidents involved relatively small vessels that were not subject to stability regulations that now apply to sail training vessels. And at least two of the cases appeared to involve powerful squalls in the vicinity of 70 knots far more than has been mentioned in connection with Concordia. And I noted yesterday that in the nearly 30 years that has passed since the loss of the Pride, the sail training community has been largely free of stability-related incidents. So we've had a pretty good track record on that account. And I also left off asking what we as a uh, community will do with the information yielded by the uh, loss of the Concordia. And I also asked, will this be more like the albatross in 1961, whereby nothing really changed, or will the legacy of the Concordia be more like the Marquez and produce some rational and sustained improvements? And we've had some suggestions from Captain Curry on that right now. And uh, would this all happen in spite of the fact that nobody died in this incident? And your answer to that question will depend on a number of things, including your interpretation of the facts, and where you choose to place your emphasis. The loss of Concordia has a number of dimensions, more than we could cover in the time available, but all of which provide food for thought, and I'd like to take a moment to, to just uh, review those. First, there's the nature of the weather event, including the possibility of inclined winds. And if we accept that inclined winds played a role, then that steers us towards certain conclusions. If we do not accept the role of inclined winds, and that steers us toward somewhat different conclusions. Any discussion of weather leads to a matter of forecasting, and whether we call what happened to Concordia a downburst or a microburst, and whether or not we use this 50-knot partition between the two, the event raises, once again, the question of the extent to which weather analysis and prediction can realistically provide warning of such a phenomenon over open ocean. And in Captain Curry's presentation, we saw uh, analysis that, it, that was available after the fact, but what can we get before something like this happens? 
Another issue pertains to the inherent stability characteristics of Concordia, both with or without inclined winds. And the knockdown cases we reviewed yesterday all involved vessels whose stability was marginal by today's standards. And at least two of them involved fairly vicious squalls. Based on Concordia's certification history, there's no reason to believe that her intact stability was deficient by the standards of today. And if we were to find out differently, that would change many things. But in the meantime, we have to ask just how uh, much reliance we can place on the stability standards we are using. And should, it be, should our stability standards be re-examined in light of the possibility of inclined winds? And if we were to re-examine our stability standards, would it even matter if we're unable to prevent down flooding? Concordia holds a number of lessons regarding equipment. Happily, many of those lessons were positive. Much of the equipment worked as intended, but there were also some unpleasant surprises, and the vulnerability of the GMDSS set was particularly sobering, as it was lost almost immediately. The TSB report raised several uh, points regarding training for officers, including stability training, knockdown training, and drills specifically designed for knockdown scenarios. And I would agree with Captain Curry that uh, more targeted stability training would be welcome, but to assume it would have made a difference to the Concordia is a less clear pathway. But I think we should all agree that training our crews to at least think about how to respond to a knockdown would be worthwhile. Clearly, down flooding is a major issue here, and it has at least two aspects. One aspect pertains to design, that is, the number, the location, and the arrangements of topside penetrations. In other words, your vents, your doors, your windows. And in that regard, I would be surprised if we found that the arrangements on Concordia could not be improved upon. And as we saw, a very interesting suggestion in, in uh, Captain Curry's response there regarding uh, design of deck houses. So there are some things we can look at. But design is only part of the story when it comes to down flooding. The other aspect of down flooding in this case is the obvious fact that the weathertight doors on Concordia were open at the time of the knockdown. And this was an operational choice and one that we have all made many times. And in yesterday's presentation, I took a quick survey of who had ever sailed with their deck house doors open or hatches, and it was unanimous. We have all done that under a variety of circumstances, too. But the fact that the penetrations were open resurrects the age-old conflict between convenience and comfort on the one hand and watertight integrity on the other. While there are some situations where securing the weather deck is an easy decision, and there are other situations whereby keeping the doors open is clearly low risk, there are still other situations that fall somewhere in between. And I'm not confident that we can design away the need to make good decisions around this, uh, this matter. And this leads straight to the discussion of how we run our ships in this respect and the procedures and policies that govern our readiness for squalls. And we heard an example from Captain Curry of one organization that has already adopted different policies around this. So I'd like to take a moment to just um, talk about standardized procedures in a general way and their ability or inability to help defend against what happened to Concordia. And then I'd like to move toward a more dis specific topic of squall procedures. So many of the benefits of a good procedure are obvious. A good procedure can help avoid recurring learning curves around the same thing. Do it this way. It works. Procedures imply forethought, which is generally a good where emergencies are concerned because uh, unless we work in the emergency response business, we don't get the opportunity to refine our methods through real life experience. As a rule, knockdowns are too rare an event for us to perfect our procedures through practice, so we uh, have to learn from others and try to apply that knowledge. Procedures produce consistency where it is desired and deter trial and error where we don't want trial and error. And if there are certain steps that ought to be taken in advance, of a squall, and we ought to codify these rather than hope people have the right instincts when faced with something they have never dealt with before. 
Written procedures that are disseminated uniformly can help produce a shared mental model among the crew for what is expected of them. Rather than relying entirely upon the timely wisdom of the captain, a definitive procedure can make the desired response transparent. And this is good for teamwork and the coordination of effort. The benefits of a shared mental model are not limited to the step-by-step -step response to, say, a, knock a knockdown, for instance. Uh, creating a procedure or a policy around something transmits a signal to the crew that doing this thing, this particular thing, this particular way, is an operational priority. And avoiding a catastrophic knockdown is obviously a priority. So why wouldn't we train our crew specifically for that and give them the clearest possible guidance in advance. But it's not so simple. There are problems with procedures and policies. If they are not regularly reinforced through drills or shipboard training, they can fall by the wayside and lose their effectiveness. Without regular clarification, people may arrive at different interpretations of what a procedure really means. We had an incident on a New York City ferry a few years ago where a conning officer blacked out in the wheelhouse and he smashed into the pier, killing 11 people. The shipboard procedure called for two officers and a lookout to be in the wheelhouse at all times. But over time, individual judgment crept in. Sometimes there were three people, sometimes there were two, sometimes one. And on that particular day, the officer was alone in the wheelhouse. No one could have predicted that he would black out on that particular day, just like no one could have predicted that that particular squall would sink Concordia. The procedure requiring three people in the wheelhouse did not exist to defend against an officer blacking out. It existed because a lot can go wrong running a vessel on New York Harbor, so the safety of the vessel ought not be left to one person at any stage. The procedure was a good idea, but it wasn't followed, and that's a problem for all procedures, including those that might apply to dealing with squalls. A related problem with procedures is the fact that some people just don't buy into them. They don't follow them because they feel they are unnecessary or that they are smarter than the procedure, and these people are risk takers. They don't mean to do harm, but by ignoring a procedure, they are taking a risk that could one day do harm unexpectedly. By design, procedures and policies seek to limit the amount of personal judgment that is applied to a situation. The procedure says, do this and do it this way, regardless of what you think. Not everyone likes to have their judgment restricted, especially when they view themselves as professional and experienced. But for a procedure to work, it kind of has to be this way. Otherwise, the goal of standardization won't be achieved. Another problem with procedures is that too many of them can dilute things and the sense of priority that we want to attach to the most important things. Recently, I signed aboard a vessel as a relief mate, and when I asked to see the standing orders, I was handed a three-ring binder. And uh, I thought there must have been some misunderstanding, so I said, no, I just want to see the standing orders. And they said, no, this is the standing orders. And um, there were reams and reams of procedures and policies, many of them lifted directly out of uh, the IMO requirements. And it was really more of an operational manual than what I consider standing orders. And it was obvious that this approach was not intended to help officers make good decisions. It was intended to show compliance and protect the organization in the event of an accident. And this was not very helpful. So finally, uh, no matter how well designed your procedures are, there will always be exceptions. And the procedures that are too rigidly applied may produce officers who cannot recognize the exceptions when they arise. So let's uh, take a general idea, uh, take the general idea of standardized procedures and see how we could apply it to a squall situation. Now some people may take the view that having the doors open on Concordia was a failure of seamanship and that no procedure can take the place of good seamanship. And while indeed good seamanship, in other words, judgment, is always desirable, I don't see this as an either-or situation. Squall procedures do have the potential to reinforce good seamanship and defend against what happens. 
both our defenses, and we need all the defenses we can get because no single defense is invincible, including good seamanship. Some of you may have sailed on vessels where squall procedures were spelled out very clearly with specific tasks and duties, and for others, the instructions may be more general. Either way, the Concordia incident provides a strong motive for re-examining whatever procedures you do or don't have. For years, I and many captains before me were content with general standing orders. Call the captain if standing into danger. And that could be underway, that could be at the dock, whatever it is. It could be collision, risk of grounding, if standing into danger. Or call the captain if in doubt. And these are simple orders, and they seem to work, but now I'm not so sure they are adequate. More detail may be appropriate if we're going to get the desired results. One problem with such general instructions is that they don't always provide much guidance until the captain pronounces a course of action. And when time is of the essence, as in a knockdown or the approach of a squall, waiting for the captain does not maximize other crew members as resources. When the captain is also a watchstander, as was the case aboard Concordia, the need for downtime may produce an unspoken and unintended impediment to call the captain for things that the watch officer deems to be manageable, despite whatever the standing orders may instruct the watch officer to do. And the captain may have to manage that dynamic very carefully. Another problem with such general instructions is that they depend upon a common understanding of what constitutes a threat. Now daily we have to rely upon the good judgment of others, and to the extent we can do that, a sort of professional trust is at work, and that's very useful. But among other things, the Concordia teaches us that when it comes to squalls, what one person perceives to be a threat, another may not. And with such variables, no procedure may always be effective but I think having one is better than not. You know, you sail around for a few decades accumulating experience, either firsthand or secondhand, and you try to practice good seamanship as you have come to understand it, and you try to stay current in the field, and you develop a sense of confidence that you know what you're doing. And then something like this happens, and you have to ask, you know, what do I know? And what would happen on my vessel were I faced with a comparable situation? And in response to those questions, which I put to myself, really, I've developed a list of, of what I call my post-Concordia squall procedures. And I don't know that these actions or any combination of them would have changed the outcome. In developing this list, I don't mean to imply that these actions were ever overlooked aboard Concordia. On the contrary, many of these actions were actually deployed. I also don't wish to imply that I have any original thoughts to offer here. By and large, there's nothing new under the sun, but when something like this happens, some of the old things under the sun may be worth revisiting. And I say this not only to refresh my own operational choices, but also to invigorate what I teach younger officers and I hammer into them in order to develop that common sense of good seamanship that is the basis of professional trust. So. The autopilot, a friend once said to me, there's no such thing as an autopilot. Radical situations call for radical responses and regardless of the settings and the parameters that were selected on, a, on any given unit, an autopilot is a limiting intermediary between what a person wants to do and actually getting it done. In my post-Concordia squall procedures, I would specifically direct officers to go to hand steering in any kind of unsettled weather. If this reallocation of resources means something else doesn't get done, well, that simply signals to everyone that being ready for a squall is a high priority, and that would be a good message. Assign two people to the helm, none of them the watch officer. I can't prove that this would have made any difference on Concordia, but when I read the account of the squall, I cringed to think of the second mate stuck on the helm when there was suddenly so much else to do. And here, too, the re reallocation of resources not only enhances your capability to control the vessel, it's a signal to the entire crew of the high priority placed on squall procedures. Um, this is an old chestnut. Get the vessel before the wind early. Wind direction and strength are notoriously unpredictable in squalls, which makes this easier to say and harder to do. 
the information is, is mixed regarding the apparent wind angle in the final moments before Concordia is knocked down. And I don't know that earlier action to run would have made a difference. Once a vessel is heeled over to a, uh, to a certain point where the rig is over the water and not over the vessel, the center of resistance, meaning the hull, and the center of effort, the sails, become so unaligned that any vessel may tend to round up anyway. It's sort of like a weather vane effect, and the, uh, the hull will go to windward, uh, and, the, and the rig be swept downwind. But given what happened to Concordia, the tactic takes on renewed significance, and I would be inclined to execute it earlier than I might have in the past. And I wouldn't hesitate to use the Concordia story as a discussion point when briefing and training officers in squall tactics. Captain Curry noted that, that if the uh, wind has a vertical component, running before it may not matter or even be possible, and this may be so. But for the time being, I would still make this part of my procedures, as he did as well. Uh, get rid of sail aft. Well, this is obviously to facilitate running. Concordia had a reefed mizzen set at the time, and the captain thought that this was the right sail plan when he went below. Worse weather was not expected for many hours, and the sky gave no indication of an imminent threat. And had uh, Captain Curry been on deck moments before the squall, the mizzen might well have been taken. But either way, the fact of the, that the mizzen was set reminds me of one of the questions that arose in the aftermath of the Pride of Baltimore sinking, and that pertained to the sail plan. The sail area was very modest at the time the Pride was knocked down, a double reefed main and a four staysail. But the distribution of the sail area, having so much of it aft, inhibited bearing off. So for vessels with a hoisting gaff, setting and striking sail, the aftermost sail, it can be a lot of work for the crew. And this can influence a captain's decision making. I know this because many times I have chosen to leave something up or down so as to not needlessly work the crew if the benefits were unclear. And here's where a standing gaff with a brailing sail could be advantageous if it is less cumbersome to set and strike. Deckhouse doors and windows and other weather deck openings. Based on what I've read and what we've heard, um, there's nothing in Captain Curry's way of doing things that differs from any other vessel I've been on. And it looks to me like he was actually pretty conscientious and that surely contributed to the uh, successful evacuation. But nevertheless, water got into the vessel because the doors were open, and it's pretty obvious that whatever squall procedure a person chooses to adopt in the aftermath of this incident, it must include a trigger that gets the doors shut earlier. And whatever the difference is with the TSB report, I know that uh, Captain Curry agrees because he just explained to us what, what his, his current practice is regarding lured doors. <clears throat> 